Today's class, we want to finish up a few more examples of tactical asset allocation. It tends to be the hardest part of exam one for a lot of students. Uh, we'll do a couple more examples and then in our smaller groups, we'll do even more examples and let you actually present your answers to give you some practice. What, what you really need to do is, is take what you learned for question one, which is that whole schematic that we've been going over and over and over again. What is an investment portfolio? What are the three questions that you ask? The why, what, and how? On the what question, what are the major asset classes? Cash, cash equivalents, bonds, stocks, alternatives. And within those sub-asset classes, those major asset classes, what are the sub-asset classes? Under bonds, DC cuts I. And under DC cuts I, duration, convexity, credit, what, what are each, how do you define each one of those? What are the sub-asset classes? Remember, under duration, you have short-term, intermediate-term, and long-term. And then what are the strategies? You expect interest rates to rise. You want to shorten duration. You expect interest rates to fall. You want to lengthen duration. So if you know all of that, then you're, you're ready for the tactical allocation. And, we, and where it gets a little tricky is when you have several things going at once. So your boss expects a recession. That probably means she also expects interest rates to fall, but not always. But if she just says she expects a recession, you would just automatically assume she expects rates to fall unless she gives you some unique strategy, unique scenario where she says, I, I'm expecting a recession, but I think there's going to be some inflationary fears because of what's going on with all the stimulus. And because of that, I actually expect a recession with rising rates interest rates and rising inflation. She so would have to specifically say that. But if she just says she expects a recession, then you, you, you say, okay, we want to move up in quality. We want higher quality bonds and a recession rates will probably fall. So we want to lengthen duration. Um, within stocks, we don't want the small cap companies. We want the larger cap. We don't want high beta companies. We want low beta defensive companies. We don't want value companies. They're low risk. We want the growth companies that are higher quality that will do better in a recession plus do better when interest rates are falling. Um, so that's what you got to bring all that together. It can get a little tricky because every scenario I give you will be slightly different with its own nuances. And this is why I so strongly recommend you start you make it a habit of listening to these investment and finance podcasts. So when you hear other people talking about the material we're talking about in this class, they're not going to be radically different than what we talked about. We're, we're using pretty conventional ways of thinking about these things. You start hearing certain things, it becomes more natural, more normal. You just you hear something, it's what we call a visual intelligence. You hear something and you can automatically see the entire landscape. That's what you're trying to get to as a finance professional. Is you hear just a tidbit of information and you can automatically, like I said, you hear someone thinks a recession's coming, it tells you all kinds of things uh, from an asset allocation standpoint. And so that's what we're trying to get to. So it's going to going to take some practice. You'll get better and better at it, but you're not going to get better at it if you don't get yourself out there and listening to different sources, listening to different people, reading different things. So get into the mindset of a, of a finance professional and read articles, listen to podcasts. So we'll finish up today with tactic allocation. Plus, we'll have our smaller group practice sessions to try to really get you ready for the exam. And then once we finish that, we'll get into asset strategy execution, which is quite a few different things. We'll have to, well, the, there's some smaller things that we we'll just have to hit and go on. So it's a, a lot of different things, a lot of different topics that we'll hit. So let's do this tactical allocation one. So your boss has just provided you the following forecast. She says, I believe the looming fiscal cliff. So I did this back where the term fiscal cliff meant something. What, what they meant back then was um, U.S. government had these rules that if they, they couldn't get certain things approved, like getting the, the debt ceiling lifted so that the deficit could rise, that there was an automatically huge cut in government spending, which could be really disastrous for, for the economy. So... She says that looming fiscal cliff, it ended up not happening. Congress got their act together at the last second, but there are actually people talking about defaulting on U.S. debt, um, not, making, not making debt payments on U.S. debt because uh, U.S. was going to exceed the debt ceiling 
Um, that actually caused S&P to downgrade the U.S. Uh, U.S. debt from AAA to AA plus. So it's a big issue. It ended up not being as big of a crisis as some people thought it might be. So she's probably wrong in her forecast, but we didn't know that at the time she wrote it. The European sovereign debt crisis was still going on. You had Hungary in, in trouble. You had uh, Italy and, and Spain having serious fiscal problems. So she says that's going to send the U.S. into a recession. All right, well, that's that tells you a lot right there, right? We just talked about a recession. Wow, that means you want high quality. You definitely want to avoid stocks. You want bonds within stocks. You want high quality. You know, we've already got just right there with that one word. She expects a recession. That tells you a tremendous about, amount about how you want to invest. Japan's going to follow suit. Suit. Europe's going to continue to be in recession. So there's your developed markets. They're not going to fare well. The economic and corporate earnings growth will be well below historical levels. So not good economic growth, not good corporate earnings growth. That tells you you definitely want to be under allocated on stocks. However, emerging countries should see decent economic growth. So within, within uh, the, the world, you want the U.S. With, from a stock standpoint, U.S. stocks, developed market stocks don't look good, but emerging market stocks might be okay. They're going to have growth as their consumers start to spend more and they start opening up trade with each other. Inflation should be, remain well controlled. I didn't highlight that, but that's that would be important. If tips, remember the inflation index bonds, if they were in there, you probably wouldn't want to allocate much to them if inflation is not going to be a problem. And I expect interest rates to stay in a very tight range. I think rates will be even less volatile than currently priced in the bond market. So that's pretty important. Interest rates aren't expected to rise or fall, stay pretty flat. Now remember, this is pretty critical. Remember the interest rate curve is usually upward sloping. So longer term bonds have higher returns than shorter term bonds because the yield curve is upward sloping. So if you don't expect rates to move, you might want to go out longer term to get those higher yield of the longer term bonds. So there are times where you may actually lengthen duration, not because you expect rates to fall, but when you expect rates not to change, longer term bonds will give you a higher return than shorter term bonds just because the yield curve is upward sloping, just like you learned in 3013. So again, don't forget everything you learned in your previous classes. Remember what you learned in 3013, the interest rate curve the yield curve is normally upward sloping, so longer term bonds usually have a higher return than shorter term bonds. So if you don't expect interest rates to change, then you can get more return by going out further in duration. And they're going to be less volatile. That's going to tell us a lot about convexity and mortgage-backed securities. With most of the developed world debasing its currency, now we're talking about currency, the U.S. dollar will hold up well. That's going to be very, very important. Again, she says I'm not concerned about inflation, so she said that twice, so I highlighted it this time. So she's not concerned about inflation, but most investors are. That probably means that tips in Treasury security, inflation securities, are probably, in her opinion, are overpriced today. So that's a security you definitely would not want to buy. So I'm not sure diversifying in real assets makes sense at these assets per price at a premium. Remember when I got the alternatives? that she may off, she may say something specifically to alternatives. And she does, just like on emerging markets, she gave you something very specific on emerging markets. She gave you something real specific on real assets. So here you just have to know real assets. What is that? It's commodities. It's real estate. It's timber. They're priced at a premium. What does price at a premium mean? She thinks they're expensive. But she still wants to continue to seek ways to diversify the portfolio. All right? That's not leaving you much. We'll have to see what the choices are. Tax law changes will be important to watch. I expect our rates to increase um, to a marginal tax rate of 40% and effective tax rate of 25. Remember, if you ignore the effective tax rate, you focus only on the marginal tax rate because you're making a marginal decision about how to invest. So there the marginal tax rate. You might write that down. Marginal tax rate is 40%. That's going to help us get that tax equivalent yield, the only math problem you have on exam one. So here are your choices. The red and the green I don't give you, and all I give you, what you get on exam is what's in red and green, but without the red and green coloring. So you'll have 
long-term treasury bonds, high-quality municipal bonds, high-quality corporate bonds, mortgage-backed securities. That's all you have without the red and green. So here, there, there are there are more than one answer here. So long treasuries. I say underweight. I do want the quality, but I don't need the convexity. Essentially, what the person answered this is saying is long treasuries are fine because we're in a recession, so we 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 would mind going out on a yield curve to get those higher higher yields. Um, long term is okay because rates are stable. And we want the quality. So remember, you're going to talk about duration and quality. So we want the quality, but we can get the quality from the mortgage-backed securities. We're okay with longer term because rates are going to be stable. But with longer, with stable rates, we like to sell convexity. Remember, when you're trying to choose between long-term treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, if you're expecting interest rates not to change much, but the rates to stay stable, you can get a you can get a higher interest rate for mortgage-backed. You're essentially selling convexity. You're getting an extra yield because she expects rates to be less volatile. So the only reason now, if you said overweight long-term treasuries because you want quality and you don't mind going out on duration because rates are going to be stable, I would give you credit for that. But somewhere you probably need to say that between long-term treasuries and mortgage backs, you probably have a preference for mortgage backs. So you might overweight both of them. But overweight mortgage backs even more. So maybe your long-term treasuries are normally five percent of your portfolio. You might move them up to eight, and you might move your mortgage backs from ten up to twenty or something like that. So, so there's a few nuances in the answers. <clears throat> the the thing isn't what is the right answer. The thing is that what you write is logical and consistent. So here's one where I might say overweight both of these, but between the two of them, I'd overweight mortgage backs even more. Here I said let's underweight long-term treasuries because I want to put that ex I want to I really want to load up on mortgage-backed securities. So either way is fine. Then you have municipal bonds. All right. So remember, there's three things we're going to take stay here. First, these are long-term. Well, long-term is fine because rates are stable. You get the better yield going out. We expect recession. These are high quality, so we like the quality. So here we talked about duration. We talked about quality. So the only last thing we've got to talk about is the, the tax adjusted yield. So the current yield on the municipals is 3.8%. You divide it by one minus the uh, marginal tax rate, you get 633. You compare that to high quality long corporates, 4.9. So you prefer, you prefer municipals over high quality long-term corporates. The so high quality long-term corporates are fine. You have the high quality to what you want. Long-term is fine but you prefer municipals over corporates. Just like with the treasuries, you may actually overweight both of these, but you would overweight municipals even more. But remember what we talked about. We have two things under treasuries, quality and duration. We have three things under corporates and municipals. We have duration, quality, and a tax adjusted yield. Mortgage-backed securities, we have one thing under there, and that has to do with the stability of interest rates convexity. All right. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six things on that first page. The next group is stocks overall versus bonds. Remember, I do not give you this on the exam. You have to just know to talk about stocks overall. So we want to underweight stocks because we expect a recession and lower earnings. So you have to, you have to say, be really careful. Make sure you're having this note. You don't get any credit at all if you say underweight stocks. You have to tell me why. So here I didn't do a good job here. I say overweight high quality bonds. I should have said overweight high quality bonds due to expected recession. All right. So make sure you always put the reason why. We underweight stocks due to the recession. I'd probably give you credit here that it's, it's somewhat implied. The underweighting stocks and overweight high quality bonds because of recession. All right, so stocks versus bonds is really one thing here, and it has to do with the quality. Do you expect recession or growth? Then we have U.S. large cap, low beta stocks. There's two things here, three things here, but really two things in this section. They're large cap and they're low beta. I should have put two beta, two bullets here, so I didn't do a good job here. Overweight within stocks because we need defensive stocks in recession. That's the first thing. And we like both large cap and low beta to be more defensive. 
you need to here put two bullets. We want to overweight within stocks. Now remember that term within stocks is really important because we just said we want to underweight stocks. So we want to underweight stocks, but within stocks, we want to overweight large cap stocks because they do better than small cap in recession. And we want to overweight low beta stocks because they do better than high beta stocks in recession. All right. If you said that, you get full credit. All right. When I write these answers out, I don't quite make it as extensive as I want. So I, that's a mistake on my part. But two things. Make sure you have two bullets. Don't do what I did here. Have two bullets. Same thing on small. Well, here on small cap stocks, I just say U.S. small cap. Now, if I said U.S. small cap value stocks, you would need two bullets. You would say underweight because they'll underperform large cap in a recession. And if they were value stocks, you would say underweight as they were underperform growth stocks in a recession. All right. Here I only gave you small cap. I didn't say small cap value. So whatever I give you, if there's two things there, make sure you have two bullets. Here there's only one thing, U.S. small cap. Developed market stocks, you always have two things there. We're going to underweight because we expect a slow economy and we expect a strong dollar. So here you talk about quality and the U.S. dollar. Emerging markets within stocks, again, within stocks, we're going to overweight because they have better economic growth. On emerging market stocks, again, I don't talk about currencies there. You could could make sense on currencies, but I don't talk there. On alternatives, I only gave you one alternative to choose from. So you could have put under alternatives, real assets underweight because they're you're not expecting inflation and they looked overpriced. So there's one extra one you could have gotten there. But private equity was the only one I gave you. So so there's there's a case where you know I only gave you private equity, but you know I mentioned real assets, so you could bring real assets in and talk about it. So think beyond just the basic ones I give you. I, I get these more explicit as I go, and you'll see as we do other examples that I, I get much 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 clearer uh, as as time has progressed. So these are some of my older exam examples. So private equity. Why would do that? Well, she says she wanted some diversification. And since these don't trade in the public markets, it gives you something that doesn't quite move with everything else. I don't really believe that. In fact, I was listening to a podcast this week, a really excellent podcast, one uh, you should all listen to, but a podcast that talked about how private equity looks artificially low risk, looks artificially low correlation because it's not publicly traded, but real in reality is probably not doing very well at all in a recession. So there, there's a good basic example. Let's try another one. So your boss has just provided the following forecast. So what I recommend you do, let's read this and then hit pause on the, on the, um, on the video and just write down the different asset classes. In fact, don't watch what I'm going to do next. I'll give you, well, here's the asset classes. All right. So good. Okay. So Take a snip of this page, get all these down, and then let's read through this and you come up with your answer with all the bullets. Hit pause after I read through this. I'll help you a little bit, but I'll try not to over help you. If you want to, you can hit pause right now and read this and go ahead and answer the whole thing and then listen through to me walking through it. So you can get some practice. So you can figure out where are the areas you have you have weaknesses. All right. All right. So if you want to hit pause, hit it right now. If if not, I'll walk you through and give you some ideas on what to look for. So your boss has the following forecast. We need to position our portfolio for 2020. So this was actually um, the exam from probably last last spring. I'll give you the exam from last fall as in a practice exam. I believe the economic fallout from COVID-19 will be much worse than expected in the markets right now. Many are assuming there will be a rapid recovery in late summer, early fall, but I believe the economic downturn will be much deeper and last much longer. So boy, he was absolutely wrong on this one. Got it exactly wrong. I don't know where I got this particular forecast from, but it might have just been one I made up off the top of my head. Corporate earnings will fall and stay down for four or more quarters. As the so-called pent-up demand for consumers never materializes. That one was definitely wrong so far, but with the second wave of COVID, we'll see if we have another, we, we could have a double dip recession, we'll see. But as far as right now, what we know, this is a bad forecast. 
Consumers will be wary of spending if COVID-19 cases drop off, given fears about a second wave in the fall. So we certainly had the second wave in the fall, but it hasn't harmed consumer spending economic growth as much as this forecast. So you can see he got some things right, right, but the big picture he's gotten wrong, but that doesn't matter. We assume he's your boss, so we're going to assume that he's right. We're going to go with the asset allocation. Europe and J Japan will probably do better than the U.S. as they are much further along in handling COVID-19 and, and their economies should come out stronger and early in the U.S. That was absolutely wrong. The U.S. dollar will weaken in this environment as interest rates in the U.S. continue to fall to historically low levels. Got that one wrong. Rates will then stay very low and show little volatility as the Federal Reserve signals that it will keep low rate for an extended period of time. He got it right that the Fed would single signal low rates for an extended period of time, but as we talked about in, in a, uh, early in the semester, we saw interest rates fall to 0.5% on the 10-year Treasury, and so far in 2021, they've doubled and gone above 1%. Now, by the time you watch this video, who knows what's going to happen. I'm looking back at the, we're having a down market today, not extremely down market, uh, but the 10-year Treasury today is 1.02%. It's, it's hovering around that 1%. That rates were pretty volatile here the first part of um, 2021. So, you know, there's some things he got right and some things he got wrong. Rates will stay in a very low and, and, and so little volatility. And developing emerging countries will fare the worst. This is developing. Don't get confused. I get some students get confused between developed markets like Europe and Japan and developing or emerging markets. I probably shouldn't use the word developing, but developed, D-E-V-E-L-O-P-E-D, -E 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 developed. I don't know if it's two P's or one P. I can't remember. But developed means they're already developed. Developing are emerging markets or countries that are not developed, but they're they're getting better. So, so he's positive on Europe and Japan, especially versus the U.S. The U.S. dollar, he's negative on that, and he's very negative on emerging countries. They're going to fare the worst as of all as their healthcare systems will be inadequate to address COVID-19, and as their trade in the U.S will be weak for some time. Spreads on corporate and municipal bonds should widen dramatically. When you see spreads widening, you don't want those assets. So if, if he's saying spreads on corporates and municipal bonds are going to widen, that's a bad time to buy those. You'd rather have the treasuries, especially for the lowest quality bonds. So he's saying it's going to be a weak economy. He's not specifically saying recession. But it's sure implying kind of a double dick recession. Or we fell into the re recession because of COVID-19 and we just stay there for a long time. Corporate balance sheets are highly levered after years of firms buying back stocks and issuing debt. And municipals are fa facing huge budget crisis trying to respond to COVID-19. Here our marginal tax rate is 25%. So in this one, they we incorporated the 2017 tax law change. All right, so again, if you want to hit pause here, you can hit pause. So let's let's summarize what we've got here. Weak economy, weak earnings. So that means we want to under-allocate risk assets like stocks and move to quality like high-quality treasuries. Europe and Japan developed, so I guess developed is one P, developed markets are going to be relatively stronger. So within stocks, we have a preference for Europe and Japan. Emerging markets are going to be the weakest. We're going to have a weak dollar, another reason we like Europe and Japan. Falling interest rates with low volatility of rates, that's important. Widening spreads, especially municipals. Didn't say anything at all about inflation. But in this environment, you would assume low inflation. The consumers are not spending. The economy is weak. There's not much trade. That's the sign. Now you might pick on the fact, pick up on the fact that you have a weak dollar. A weak dollar can be inflationary because a weak dollar makes imports more expensive. But he also said he, he expects weak trade because of, of the recession. So you know, that's where I talk about these nuances. A weak dollar can be inflationary, but the economy around the world is going to be so weak, it's unlikely there's going to be inflation. 
nothing at all about alternatives other than you know it's it's most likely real estate now so you might make an argument real estate might do all right because of low interest rates but you know more than likely with COVID-19 especially commercial real estate and travel are not going to do well but there's some things you can kind of guess in here and we got the marginal tax rate of 25 percent all right so what does this imply for our allocation so let's let's think through each of these asset classes so long-term treasuries we're expecting interest rates to fall and stay stable so this sounds almost identical to what we had before long-term treasuries we definitely want that for quality we definitely want a lengthen duration so duration positive for long-term treasuries we'd like to lengthen duration as we expect rates to fall long-term treasuries should be positive because of the high quality intermediate term inflation index treasuries he didn't say anything about inflation but the implications are we don't we're, we're not worried about inflation here it's a very weak economy so we'd probably not be buying a lot of those mortgage backs probably sound pretty good look at the starting yield 290 versus 125 and we expect interest rates to fall and stay stable now you could go a couple directions with this some students pointed out that if you expect rates to fall, you might get a lot of mortgages re refinancing. And that certainly happened in the last few months. We've seen some refinancing as mortgage rates fell to all-time historical lows. Uh, so there's a couple nuances you can do there. Medium quality, municipals and corporates. First of all, it's intermediate term. We'd probably prefer longer term, and we'd probably prefer higher quality. So on the quality, we prefer high quality to medium quality because spreads are gapping out. On duration, we'd probably prefer long-term than short-term because interest rates are falling. And then we need to take this 2.75% and divide it by one minus the 25% marginal tax rate and compare that to the 335. I'm pretty sure it's higher. And so we're going to underweight them, but we're going to underweight corporates more than municipals because municipals have a slightly higher tax adjusted yield. But he did emphasize he had a strong concern about municipals because of the COVID impact on their budgets. So you, there's a few ways you could go here. High yield junk bonds, you definitely want to avoid those. High yield, remember, that's the lowest quality you can get on the bonds. You want to underweight that. Notice there's nothing that says stocks versus bonds. You just have to add that. That might actually be the first thing you talk about. So in this environment, you'd want to underweight stocks, overweight high quality bonds because of the expected weak economic growth. Make sure you put that because of in there. All right, here's two asset classes here, really three, but we're going to ignore the US versus non-US and talk about that under develop and emerging. So we have large cap and we have low beta. Within stocks, remember that term within stocks because remember we're underweighting stocks, but within stocks, we will have a preference for large cap stocks because they do better than small cap stocks when you have weak economic environment. And within stocks, we would over allocate low, low beta stocks versus high beta stocks because they'll do better in recession. We want defensive stocks. Small cap, two things here. Small cap, we would underweight small cap, especially relative to large cap because they won't do well in a, in a recession or a weak economy. And then within stocks, we would underweight value versus growth because these are low quality companies. They don't do well in a weak economy. Developed market stocks, we're expecting them to do better economically than the US. So we overweight them because of the strong economy. And we would overweight them because we're expecting a weak US dollar. Emerging market stocks, we would definitely underweight them because they're expected to really suffer because of COVID-19 and really have weak trade. Alternatives uh, here, um, gold might be a good one. We're expecting economic turmoil, so gold might be a good place to be. Some people emphasize that real estate might do well with, with low mortgage rates and low interest rates, but at the same time with COVID-19, that may not be so good. So alternatives there, you'll just have to think through. Uh, what are your choices there? Some people say, well, timber might be a good, good place because Mortgage rates are low, so real estate, residential real estate might do well, which means timber might hold up well and you get good diversification. So there's where you just go wild. Think about everything you learn on exam one and what can you bring into your answer here. All right, so I didn't give you the actual answer on these, 
but um, overweight long-term treasuries, maybe not overweight them as much as mortgage backs, but overweight them, the length and duration because of falling rates and because you want the high quality. Underweight inflation-linked treasuries because you don't expect much inflation. Overweight mortgage-backed security. Let's go back and read what she said. Falling rates with low volatility. So mortgage, if you said on the one hand, and you can give me an on the one hand versus on the other hand question. So you can say mortgage-backed on the one hand. I would overweight them to get that higher starting yield because we're expecting stable rates. However, before we get the stable rates, we're expecting rates to fall. So that might, that might cause some, some refinancing of mortgage backs. So between treasuries and mortgage backs, I'll go either direction, however you want to argue it. On medium quality intermediate term municipals and corporates, you want to underweight both of them because you expect spreads to widen. So you don't want medium quality, you prefer high quality. They'll do badly in a weak economy. You want to underweight them because you prefer long term to intermediate term because you're expecting interest rates to fall. And between the municipals and corporates, once you you come up with that adjusted tax effective yield, you want to uh, make sure uh, you know you do the one that's if you, you want to underweight both of them. Which one do you under want to under underweight more? So if you take that 0 0.0275 divided by one minus 25%, you get 3.67%. 3.67% is higher than 3.35%. So you took the 2.75% divided it by one minus 0.25, the marginal tax rate, that gives you 3.67%. And because of that, you would probably between, you're gonna underweight both of them but within uh, your corporate sector, you'd probably overweight municipals versus corporates unless you might want to make the argument that municipals have a higher tax effective yield because municipals may be under more pressure than corporates because of the COVID impact. So you, there's a couple ways you could go there. Either is right. I'll give you full credit. You just make sure under these two, you have three things to talk about. So you had two things under treasuries, quality and duration. One thing under tips, talking about inflation. One thing on the court of mortgage backs, talking about volatility rates, although you could bring in the falling mortgage rates and refinancing. Three things under munis and corporates, quality, talking about spreads widening, duration, talking about you prefer longer term to intermediate because rates are falling. And then between municipals and corporates, you'd probably prefer municipals because of the higher tax adjusted yield, though you might put some caveat there that you're worried about them. One, one thing under high yield, you want to underweight high yield because of quality, weak economy. So you definitely don't want high yield in the env environment that, that he just gave you. The one that's not on the list, stocks versus bonds, you would definitely be under allocating stocks and over allocating high quality bonds because of the expected weak economy. Within large cap, within stocks, you would overweight large cap because of weak economy. You would over allocate low beta defensive stocks because of weak economy. So there's two things there. Under small cap, you underweight small cap because of weak economy. You would prefer large cap to small cap. And you would underweight value in a weak economy. You would prefer growth stocks to value stocks because in a weak economy, small value stocks are weaker, financially weaker. Develop market stocks, two things there. So there's two things there, two things there, two things here. So we expect developed markets to do better than U.S. So overweight within stocks, overweight developed markets. And we expect a weak dollar, so overweight developed market. Underweight emerging market stocks because of the expected weak e e economic growth there. And alternatives there, you got to talk. There's probably two or three things you can say there. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine for stocks versus bonds, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 things, two to three things here. So 18 to 19 things I'm looking for. So hopefully your answer had all of those. And we'll practice this more. If you have certain weaknesses, certain places you're just not getting them, then keep practicing. You shouldn't be able to do this whole thing. So, you know, get better and get better. One thing to think about right now is you might feel uncertain right now, but think about how you would have answered this question if you'd done it back in December before you took this class. Are you at least better now than when you were back in December? 
So get some encouragement that you're starting to get you're starting to get the jargon, you're starting to get the the pers perspective and the nuances. Uh, so if you're getting better, get encouragement from that, and then say I'm not where I need to be. So practice more and more and more. All right. So we'll get a little more practice on that. So there there we have it. So that's that's uh that's another example. That's as far as I'm going to go in the YouTube lectures on tactical asset allocation. We're going to move to a new topic now. Um, and get into asset class ex uh, strategy execution. But we will practice more in our smaller groups, so you'll get more practice. And you're always welcome to call and email me if there's certain parts of this that just aren't, aren't sinking in yet. All right, so let's move up. This is about page 27 in notes. It could be a slightly off one page or the other, but it's just look for the execution of asset allocation. All right, so we finished everything for exam one. Now we're going to move into a lot of material, very exciting material, but it's a lot more, a lot more variety now, this part of the class. But we'll, we'll be jumping around in different topics. Um, so the first thing we want to talk about is you finish everything on the why question and on the what question. Now you're getting to the how question. So on the how question, this is part of exam one, but just that last part of the three questions is how are you going to execute your asset allocation? So as we talked about, you have two questions to ask here. Do you do it yourself or do you outsource it to someone else? If you're going to outsource it to someone else, that's called security selection. You're going to decide if you're going to buy um, uh, Microsoft or, or Alphabet or Amazon or Walmart, that's security selection. Are you going to decide which stocks you want to buy, which bonds you want to buy? In that case, you have to hire a broker. We'll talk about here, and I'll, I'll actually do some example trade. I won't do, actually do the trades, but I'll go into my broker, and I'll show you how I would do the trades. I'll do go all the way through to, to until I hit the button execute, and I won't actually execute it. If you're not going to do it yourself, you're going to outsource it, then you're going to do manager selection. You have to pick a money manager, and we'll talk about that here pretty quickly. So you're going to pick not what you invest in, but with whom you invest. Who is going to make those this, this decisions? So instead of you deciding between Alphabet and Microsoft, you're going to hire someone else to make that decision. And you can do a combination of the two. So you might say, you know what, with small cap value stocks, I'm going to do security selection because I think I have a pretty good process. But on U.S. large cap stocks, I'm going to just hire a manager because, boy, everyone's out there. Or I might actually go passive on large cap stocks. So I'll be passive on large cap stocks, and I'll pick an index manager there. I'm going to go active on uh, U.S. small cap stocks, but I'm going to hire a manager to do that. But I'm going to be active and do security selection on U.S. Um, US uh, bonds, whatever. That's it's fairly unlikely a small investor would do that, but it can be all kinds of different combinations. So you might do security selection on some assets. You might be active on some assets. You might hire a manager on some. You might be passive. If you're passive, you almost always hire a manager and hire you know Vanguard or, or BlackRock. So the second question, are you active or passive? Are you going to try to beat the market? You can try to beat the market at the asset class level. So you're making decisions like we just did on the tactical allocation. Do I invest in large cap stocks or small cap stocks? That's the asset cap class level. And are you going to be active at the securities level? So that's that Alphabet versus Microsoft question. And again, you can have all different combinations. So you might say, you know what? I, I don't know which stock's going to do well. So I'm just going to buy the market. I'm going to be passive within asset classes. But between asset classes, I'm going to be active. So when I buy U.S. large cap stocks, I'm just going to buy index managers. I'm going to be passive. I'm just going to try to match the market. However, I think U.S. large cap stocks look really expensive right now, and U.S. small cap value stocks look really good. So I'm going to. So even though I'm passive, I'm going to allocate more to U.S. small cap value stocks and less the U.S. large cap stocks, especially the growth stocks. So I'm going to be active on the asset class level, but passive on the securities level. Hard exact opposite. You might be passive on the asset class level and active on the security level. I've seen it both directions. Um, passive 
Jack Bogle, I do recommend go out there. Jack Bogle has a book, which is not my favorite book because it's essentially a collection of all of the articles he's written. So there's a lot of redundancy, but you know, if you want to get a collection of all of his all of his articles, you know, go buy one of his books and you'll just have to realize it's it's not a book that logically flows from start to finish. It's just you know, just the same topics over and over again from a different perspective. Um, but he says buying the market, passive investing, the key here is you're saving on expenses. You're not paying because when you do security selection or you hire a manager, you're going to increase your costs quite dramatically. And so Jack Bogle says the main advantage of passive investing is you save money. You're not wasting money doing things that doesn't work. The history has shown active investing doesn't perform all that well, but it does cost you more money. So you're better off to save the money and go passive. All right. So bef before we get into that, I want to talk this second issue real quickly on manager selection. How do you go about actually picking managers that will do well? And this is just based on my research. And I'm going to give you five things that I have found that work. Three of them come from Jack Bogle and James Montier and from others. Charles Ellis, there's a lot of other, other people out there really famous on this. But Jack Bogle, his book, Don't Count on It. Again, it's a book that's just a collection of his articles. You can also find Jack Bogle. Unfortunately, he passed away a couple years ago. He was, in, in my opinion, he was somewhat of the moral compass for finance. He was our ethics, you know, he was our conscious talking to us. Always took the high road, was always brutally honest about our industry, and was quite outspoken about what he thought our industry is doing wrong. So we lost a really powerful ethical voice with Jack Bogle's passing away. But he's still out there in many interviews. And we're very fortunate he lived as long as he did because he actually had a heart transplant surgery many years ago. He lived a lot longer than expected. So we really benefited from his time of, of preaching to us. I, I saw him at a couple of conferences and he, he was an amazing speaker and scary speaker. You did not want to speak right before him because if you did and he disagreed with you, he would, he would come right up and and criticize everything you just said. He didn't do it in a mean way, but he certainly put you on the spot. So um, it was interesting listening to him. Very impressive man, very tall, a very deep voice. So he's just a very, very um, present person when he was in the room. You just knew he was there. Obviously, he was an extremely wealthy gentleman, and he didn't really, didn't, I, I think, you know, you say he, he, he was ethical and spoke out because he was so wealthy, so he didn't have it, he didn't have any um, incentive uh, not to speak his mind, but he, he spoke his mind even before he had his great wealth. So he was always always the conscious of finance. So I'd recommend read his book, but or go out to YouTube and look at some of his interviews. He was a very interesting man to listen to. James Montier, really good writer. He has some great articles. Um, in fact, I have a collection of a PDF of all of his articles if you'd like them. You know, email me and I'll send them over. Some really, in the, he's an excellent, excellent writer. He's at GMO right now. So if you go to GMO.com and register with his site, you can get his latest articles there. I actually need to get out there and see what he's written later lately. But he has a really good book out there, the Little Book of Behavioral Behavioral. That should probably should be behavior behavioral finance. A L on the end. Um, so the two of them talk about how should you pick managers. So you, you got to go out there. You want to hire someone to manage your lar U.S. large cap portfolio. So what are you going to do? How are you going to pick one? You got Fidelity. You got T. Rowe Price. You got BlackRock, Vanguard. Boy, there's just tons and tons of managers. There's actually probably more mutual funds in the U.S. than there are stocks in the U.S. So you have plenty of choices. So whom are you going to select? So let me give you the three things they talked about. And the number one thing, obviously, Jack Bogle talked about was management fees. Management fees dominate everything else. If you have to make a choice between two managers or three managers or four managers, just pick the one with the lowest fees. And that will probably serve you well over time. It's amazing that that's the case. Uh, but there is no evidence in finance that you pay, you get what you paid for. 
you know, and a lot of places, in a lot of parts of, of the finance world, if you try to be cheapskate and save money, you end up with a really bad product, but that's not true with, with mutual funds. High, more expensive mutual funds do not perform better than low expense mutual funds, and that's even before fees. You look at the returns before fees, they still don't outperform, and then you had their, add their higher fees, and they definitely underperform. So there's one example right there. So let me give you a couple examples here so you can see what I'm talking about with fees. So I went into Yahoo Finance and I brought in the Fidelity Contra Fund. Here's what it's done the last few years. Longer term, it's underperformed the S&P 500. So we might look at that when we have a chance. But what I'm going to click on is Profile. When you click on Profile, it tells you it's Fidelity Contra Fund, tells you who the manager is. It gives you the Morningstar style box, so we'll we'll have to look at that. I don't know why it's not showing up, but we'll look at that on some funds. But what I want to look at is expenses. So if you look at the expenses here, their expense ratio is 0.85%. That's you can say 85 basis points. So here's one time where we use basis points again. Their expense ratio is 85 basis points. The average for the category is 105, 104 basis points. So they're about 20 basis points cheaper, so that's good. So that keeps keeps their expenses low. The other thing you notice, the 12B1 fees are not listed. NA probably, probably means not available. At USA, when I was there, we, we didn't do 12B1 fees. Essentially, that's a finder's fee. I don't like 12B1 fees because that's, I think they set up really bad incentives. Essentially, you have these financial planners, and you tell them, hey, if you push our mutual funds, we'll give you a, uh, a kickback fee. We'll give you a fee under the table. That really destroys the um, objectivity of that financial planner. If they're going to get a fee from the mutual funds that they recommend, then they no longer have, a, have an objective, unbiased view of the world. So 12B1 fees. The other thing you notice are load fees. I would never buy a mutual fund that has loads. You can have a load at the beginning. When you buy it, which means you give them $100,000, they're going to take $5,000 of your money up front. And then if you decide to sell it a year later, they'll take another $1,300 of your money. So there is no evidence, in fact the evidence is quite the contrary, that firms, mutual funds that charge low feeds, they do worse than funds that don't, even if you exclude the low feeds. But how are you going to possibly make money if you start off the first day you invest, you already have a 5% loss, and you know there's another 1.3% loss coming when you get out. And the really crazy thing with these funds that charge low feeds is their expense ratios are higher too. So these are funds that do low feeds are essentially ripping their customers off. Now, there are a few examples I've seen. I know the Washington Mutual Fund, um, they have low fees, but they only charge them to their retail investors. And so what they're doing with low feeds is try to keep small investors out and then institutional, large institutional event managers don't get the low fees, load fees, fees. So that's their way of keeping the small, small investors out. So that's the first thing. So you're just comparing these two. You say, well, Fidelity looks pretty good. You might compare Confidelity, Fidelity to a few other funds. 85 is a pretty high expense ratio, in my opinion. That means just off the bat to try to beat the market, they're going to have to beat the market by 85 basis points just to tie the market. So before fees, they've got to beat the market by 85 basis points so that after fees, they tie. So that 80, beating the market by 85 basis points on average every year is a pretty difficult task. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough thing to do. Um, you can see it's a large fund. It has $136 billion in it. Um, it's year-to-date return. That must be 2020. Um, that's, that's a pretty massive return. doesn't have a yield, which doesn't make sense. It's Morningstar is three stars. What does that mean? Well, it's a pretty average fund. However, we did a study of Morningstar stars and discovered there's no relationship between Morningstar stars and how mutual funds perform in the future with one exception, one star funds. You definitely want to avoid one star funds and those are funds that are probably going to be shut down or merged into another fund. 
they're the ones to avoid because when you have a one star fund, you just know that fund's not going to make any, it's not going to be sold. No one's going to buy. It doesn't mean it's a bad fund. It could just have had a kind of bad luck for a few months, but it's a one star fund. But other than that, two star, three star, star four star, and five star funds all have the exact same expect, expected future performance. So Morningstar ratings don't don't tell you anything. Um, so you can get the holdings, you can get performance. It just tells you, um, you know, essentially the basics. One thing it doesn't tell you is how it will do going forward. Now look at this manager. He's been there for a long time, since 1990. So this guy's been managing this fund for 30 years. So what does that tell you? Well, he definitely has a process that he believes in. And if you talk to him and he sounds smart, you, you might say, well, um, he's a smart guy. I like what he's saying. So I'll stick with him. The downside of that, he's been managing this fund for 30 years. Who is going to replace him? So, you know, it's, those are the two things you have to be concerned about. So we can compare that to a Vanguard index fund. So this is a passive investment. Let's look at the fee. Notice the fee here is only four basis points. Remember for Fidelity, it was 85. So for Vanguard, it's four basis points. The average category is 90. This is a very large, you know, several times larger than the Contra Fund, $637 billion. You know, Vanguard manages $5 trillion in assets. So this is one of their bigger funds. It's a five-star rated fund. Here's the one place where Morningstar rating actually helps you because with a passive fund, all you care about is the fees and how good of a job they match. They do matching the index and they do a very, very good job of matching the index. So there's, there's the Vanguard. Let's look at the actual performance here. So what I did is I brought Fidelity in and I brought Vanguard in. And what I did is I, I linked the two. If you had invested $1 in Fidelity, this blue line is what you would have had. If you invested $1 in the Vanguard fund, the orange line is what you would have had. We can actually calculate the, the geometric return, the annualized geometric return. So we'll learn that later in class, but what we do is we take the ending value divided by the beginning value, raised to, and there's about, raised to, there's about 250 days in a year. We divide that by the number of days I have here. Minus one, and there's the fidelity return. That looks pretty respectable. Respectful is 10.6% versus the S&P only 7.33%. So it looks like the Contra Fund did very well. This is going back to 2000. So we've got two big stock sell-offs there. We have the 2008 crisis. Well, we have the end of uh, 2018, that big sell-off. Then you have the COVID-19 sell-off. And since then, it's just been to the races. Pretty interesting. We could do the last five years. So last five years, maybe from 2016, and compare it from there. And so here we'd have to count. Our count would only be up to, I should have gotten the line number there, but um, so. 3937. 3937. You can see there they've outperformed the last five years. So the Contra Fund looks like a fund. Um, so it, from here, you can see it's outperformed. The, the graph is not accurate because it assumes you sold everything and rebought it here, but you can see they've outperformed both periods by a pretty significant amount. And that's one reason why this is a very popular fund. It has done a good job. It is a contra fund. Um, 
That might imply it's more of a value fund than a growth fund, but who knows what their actual strategy is. But anyway, that's the first thing. So we see the contra fund starts off with the disadvantage that they're, they're going to cost you 85 basis points, whereas you can get the Vanguard fund for just four. But you can see the contra fund is a fund that has done really well and has beat the market. And that's probably why their manager has 30 years experience because he's done a good job with this fund. If he had not been beating the market, he probably would have lost his, his job. So management fees. The second thing you look at is turnover. You can get turnover from these from Yahoo Finance. Turnover, the, the thought there is firms that buy and sell frequently. They're constantly selling stocks, buying stocks, high turnover. They tend to underperform funds with low turnover. So Fidelity, Contra Fund, you can see their turnover is 26%. That sounds pretty low. I've seen firms with turnovers of 100%, 200%. I actually manage a mutual fund who had a reported turnover of 300% as a fund. I absolutely hated managing. I didn't really agree with its, like its strategy all that much. Um, so you can get high turnovers and low turnovers. I don't know if I can find a fund with a high turnover, but you look at that. So it's another thing. So you want lower fees and you want lower turnover. So here, here's the Vanguard fund. You can see its turnover is really low, which you expect. Now, you might ask, why isn't their turnover zero if they're an index passive investor? But there are stocks that come in and out in the S&P. Y'all probably heard the news that Tesla was added to the S&P 500. So it comes in, something else goes out. So you, know, you've, you, you, you have those kind of changes going on. But that's the only trades they have really have to make is when something changes in the index. So their turnover is going to be really, really low. So I've given you two things that are really as easy to pick up on. You can just go out and get them off of Yahoo Finance. The third thing relates to what bad investors do. What bad investors do is they sell their winners too fast and they hold on to their losers too long. So what happens is it has to do with the ego and so we buy a stock and it goes up 10%. We're like, wow, I made a good decision. I want to brag about that to my friends. But hey, if I hold on to it, it could crash. So let me sell it now so I can brag about how I bought this stock and made 10%. And then another stock you buy for 100 bucks and it falls 10%. You're like, well, if I sell it now, I have to admit I made a mistake. I'll wait till it bounces back. Then it falls 20%. You're like, well, it's still going to bounce back. I, don't, I certainly don't want to sell it at 20% loss. And then it falls 30 Finally. It falls 40% and you finally sell it and you have this huge loss. And that's what retail investors do a lot of, is they sell their gains way too fast and they hold on to their losers way too long. And in fact, in some really strong bull markets when stocks were up a bunch, there are studies that have shown that small retail investors actually lost money on stocks during these strong bull markets because they made those type of mistakes where they sold gains too fast and held on to losers too long. Well, it's not just small investors that do that. Professional investors do that well, as well. And so if you actually look at their gain percentage to loss percentage, and what you're trying to do is see, are there, are there gains like five and 6% gains and their losses are like 12 and 15 and 20% losses? You know, if they're skewed that they take larger realized losses and they take realized gains, that's a fund you want to avoid. The problem is this data is not easily available. It's just really, really tough to get your hands on. So it'd be nice. There was a study done on this that showed that that was a very clear indicator of which funds do well and which ones do poorly. But it's it's hard. It's really hard to, the, to find that data. Now, there's a couple that I've discovered on, on my own research. One is reversion to the mean. Funds that have recently done poorly are more likely to do well going forward, and funds that have recently done well are more likely to do poorly over time. It's not a strong relationship, but there is a relationship. What I did is I, I did a regression. I took funds, funds ranking for three years, and I graphed that against the ranking the next three years. And what I want to do is say is, well, the funds that did really well these three years, did they also do really well these three years. And if past performance predict the future performance, you should see a perfect vertical line. So the fund that was number one the last these three years should be number one the next three years. And the firm that was in last place these three years should be last place. And what I found is not a perfectly vertical line up, but a slightly slope flying going down. 
It wasn't a strong relationship, wasn't really statistically significant, but there is a tendency that funds that have done well recently will do poorly. So let's say you have two funds and you cannot decide between the two of them. And they have both have really good long-term performance, but one's done really well recently, one's done really poorly recently. You would probably be statistically better off doing the one, picking the one that has recently done poorly. And then the last one, and this is one that definitely I noticed when I when I when they made me head of equities. So I had all these mutual funds. My first my first foray into the mutual fund world, and I'm not a big fan of mutual funds. That was a job I was a little bit leery of. Uh, you know, how, how am I going to get this to work with my beliefs? So the first thing I noticed was it didn't matter what period of time we looked at, Vanguard always ranked number one. They were always the best performing fund family. And USA ranked kind of in the top quartile, but never, never number one. Fidelity was kind of third place sometimes and eighth place sometimes. T. Rowe was up, you know, just number one was always Vanguard and the others kind of moved around, moved around quite significantly. So I wanted, I, I, my question was, what is the difference between Vanguard and the others? My first thought was, well, Vanguard is number one because they're, a, they're passive. They're index investors and their fees are really low. So I said, let's, re, let's rerun all this, but take out Vanguard's passive funds and only look at their active funds. And guess what? Vanguard was still number one. So it didn't matter. So that was my question. And I, I looked at a lot of things, trying to see what was the huge difference between Vanguard and the others. And the number one thing I found was their patience with portfolio managers. Most other fund families, if they had a portfolio manager that had a bad couple of quarters, they would fire them and replace them with someone else. Now you can see the Fidelity Fund I just showed you with Contra Fund, they stuck with that manager for 30 years. That is pretty rare for a fund, fund like Fidelity. F Fidelity changes managers all the time. And Vanguard doesn't. Vanguard has a manager that had a really bad two or three years and they don't fire them, they stick with them. It's an intelligent person, they know what they're doing. Their policy makes sense. It makes sense that they underperform in this period because this is a time when uh, when low quality companies were doing really well, what we call a junk rally. It makes sense they would underperform in that period of time. We'll stick with them. More than any other fund family, Vanguard stuck with their managers. And since they Vanguard did with most of their funds, what Fidelity did with that one fund, the Contra Fund. And I, I reported that back to USA's management, and they said, yeah, that makes sense. We can see that. We hire intelligent people. They know what they're doing, and we know they're going to underperform some periods of time. So let's stick with them. And right after that meeting, they said, when are you going to hire this manager? Because they've had a bad last couple of quarters. So it, it goes in one ear, out the other. And why is that? Well, Jack Bogle has explained this better than anyone. He says... We are, we are no longer portfolio managers, we're marketers. We're pushing funds, and you can only really push a fund that has done well. It doesn't matter if it did well because of luck or skill. That's what you can market. So fund families, they market the funds that have done well. They tend to make a change in the funds that haven't done well just so they can say they've done something. It's quite a little racket. But anyway, it's, it's, that's my philosophy. There are some things you can definitely use there. To help you, the first two are the easiest to measure. The third one's practically impossible. The next two, pretty easy to measure. Reversion to the mean, you can definitely measure that. Just look at the last three years' performance. Manager longevity, just like what I showed you, is you know look at a fund family. This is the overall family, and try to find a fund family that they stick with their managers and not constantly changing managers. So we'll stop there, and we'll get into issues on securities land, uh, security selection and manager selection as we do go into the next few classes.